Hello and welcome to our Art and Architecture webinar series. I'm Kurt Camillo, the Curator of Fine Art at American Ancestors and the New England Historic Genealogical Society. I will have the pleasure of being your host and moderator today and our and virtual MC for our big event. Every time we have something French, it's a big event. American Ancestors is a nonprofit organization supported by our members and donors. We're the oldest and largest genealogical society in the world. We specialize in providing resources, research, and expertise that uncover the stories of families, family objects, and family homes. We are pleased to offer such programming for our members and friends around the world. In 1775, the Count d'Artois, the future King Charles X, purchased the Bagatelle estate, which was then located in the woods halfway between Paris and Versailles. The sumptuous neoclassical chateau the Count constructed there was the destination for Marie Antoinette, Napoleon I, and the King of Rome, among many other famous visitors. Spared by the revolution, Bagatelle was purchased in the 19th century by the third Marquess of Hartford, an English aristocrat who lovingly restored the architectural gem. Acquired by the city of Paris in 1905, the 59-acre park with its magnificent rose garden was carefully maintained, but it wasn't until 2020 that the chateau itself was restored to its former glory. Philanthropist and art collector Nicholas Catlin worked in finance before dedicating himself to art, history, and heritage. He's involved with many international museums and is chairman of the Chateau de Bagatelle Foundation. Using spectacular new photography that was commissioned for his 2023 book, Bagatelle, A Princely Residence in Paris, Nicholas will take us on a luscious tour of the Chateau and its fabulous, I have to say, sometimes provocative history. Please join me in welcoming Nicholas Catlin. Thank you, Kurt. So welcome everyone to this session. I'm extremely happy and privileged to be here with you today. And I will take you through the history of Bagatelle. And you'll see in this presentation, um, pictures of architecture, uh, drawings of gardens, but also a lot of portraits because as Kurt just mentioned, Bagatelle, uh, the story of Bagatelle is very much the story of all the personalities that owned it or visited it. And these personalities have been some of the most important uh, in the political and romantic history of France, but also in the global history of collecting. So um, we'll talk about Bagatelle at the beginning of the 18th century, we'll talk about Bagatelle uh, when the Comte d'Artois purchased it and built the chateau that exists today, the various people that owned it at the beginning of the 19th century, Napoleon, uh, the French royal family, and then as Court mentioned, uh, Lord Hartford and Richard Wallace who owned it at the end of the 19th century. And then also briefly at the end about what happened uh, after 1905 when the chateau was bought by the city of Paris. And I believe at the end, we'll have an opportunity to uh, for a Q&A session. So let's get started um, with the next slide. And this is uh, the Mont Valérien, which is on, on the other side of the Seine from the Bois de Boulogne in the west of Paris. And you see the Seine there. And you see a little um, uh, abbey with a red roof there, and that's the Abbey de Longchamp, uh, which was not far from uh, the Chateau, the, the Bagatelle estate at the time, and the Bois de Boulogne. To put things in perspective, you have to realize that the Bois de Boulogne was at the time a very large and dense oak forest, which had been used for hunting by uh, generations of French kings. And this is where the Bagatelle estate was. And you'll see um, that at the beginning of the 18th century, uh, it belonged to uh, the person we'll see on the next slide, uh, which is the gentleman here on the right, uh, who is named the Maréchal d'Estrée. And um, the Maréchal d'Estrée here is face to face with the Régent, 
And while the Maréchal d'Estrée owned the house at Bagatelle, uh, the region on the left actually uh, used it more than he did. And the reason for that is that the Maréchal d'Estrée, who was a very prominent uh, member of the French court at the time, uh, was all busy with his activities in Paris. And Bagatelle was in fact uh, used by his wife, La Maréchale d'Estrée, who had a very uh, bad reputation at the court at the time. The reason for that is the Maréchal, La, La Maréchale d'Estrée was very good friends with another lady at court named Mademoiselle, Mademoiselle de Charolais. And La Maréchale d'Estrée, La Maréchale d'Estrée and Mademoiselle de Charolais used the house of Bagatelle to entertain the Régent. And by entertaining, we mean that the Régent could escape the uh, sometimes uh, burdensome life at court uh, and come to Bagatelle and uh, have nice parties there. And more importantly, um, entertain his current mistresses or choose his new mistresses. So you can see there that right from the beginning, the estate of Bagatelle where the, where was a place of pleasure and a place where court life could be viewed, could be lived, sorry, outside of the view of, um, you know, the general public. And indeed, um, this is a painting that is today at the Wells Collection uh, that dates back to the 19th century, actually. It was painted by Eugène Lamy. Uh, but this painting is um, aiming to represent life at court at the time of the Régent. And you can see that um, the theme is very much one of partying and drinking too much and luscious relationships. And that gives you a little bit of a sense of uh, the parties that were taking place uh, at Bagatelle at the time, although Bagatelle didn't look like this. It was a rather small house, uh, but this is what life at Bagatelle would be about. Um, and we're in the years, you know, 1710, 1720. And uh, of course the key person there uh, was, um, this Mademoiselle de, Mademoiselle de Charolais that I mentioned about, and we can see her residence uh, over the next slide, which is the Chateau de Madrid. So the Chateau de Madrid had been built by uh, François Le Premier, and it was very close. It was in fact adjacent to Bagatelle. The Chateau has been destroyed at the end of the 18th century, so it doesn't exist anymore. And this Mademoiselle de Charolais that I mentioned before was actually living there so she was very close by to the Maréchal de, to La Maréchale d'Estrée, and they could uh, together entertain the court, um, you know, hidden away from the court. Um, and after the Régent uh, enjoyed the benefits of Bagatelle, the next person that would visit would be the young Louis XV, uh, right at the beginning of his reign, and we can see him um, there in the next portrait. Um, and he's he's very young there, and um, Louis the Fifteenth um, was very much th the target of many parties at court who were trying to influence him, influence his policies, and influence his reign. And one of the ways to do that was to introduce to him the right mistresses that would. Um, convince him to go in this or that direction. And Mademoiselle de Charolais that we mentioned before, uh, that you can see, uh, you can see her portrait in the next, uh, in, in the next uh, picture here, um, was very, very good at this. And um, she was so powerful at court um, that she became uh, really one of the leading figures of uh, life uh, in the early years of the reign of Louis XV. And Voltaire uh, wrote a poem about her, which I'll read to you. And it says, Angelic Friar Charolais, tell us how it came to pass that monkish rope in such a ray doth serve as girdle to our Venice. It's not very clear what he means, but in fact, what he means is, 
how come that a woman with such a terrible reputation as you is dressed like a Franciscan friar? And in fact, Mademoiselle de Charolais always wanted to be represented in this dress. And um, you can imagine all the significations that this could have. It might be difficult to imagine based on this portrait was why she had uh, such an influence on Louis XV, uh, but you can see it in the next portrait. This is an extract from, uh, oh, sorry, this is a detail of a painting that belongs to a friend of mine. It's uh, hung above his uh, chimney piece in his library. And you can see there that this woman could be extremely seductive and uh, convincing. And so life at Bagatelle went on with this Mademoiselle de Charolais and her friend, uh, La Maréchale d'Estrée, uh, organizing parties uh, for Louis XV as a young man. But then uh, Mademoiselle de Charolais eventually died. Um, the ownership of Bagatelle uh, changed hands and Louis XV moved his mistresses uh, to Versailles. And so different kind of parties uh, started to take place at Bagatelle, which you can see um, in our next pictures here, um, because the new owner of uh, Bagatelle, a lady named Madame de Montconseil, while uh, she didn't quite manage to attract the king at her little Bagatelle estate, um, she had been working at the court of King Stanislas, the exiled king of Poland uh, who was uh, living in Alsace at the time. And King Stanislas was the father of um, the Queen of France, the wife of Louis XV. And he would often travel between his estate and Versailles to visit his daughter. And this was the opportunity for the new owner of Bagatelle, uh, Madame de Montconseil, to organize parties for him there which were a lot less um, ambiguous, uh, but certainly very frivolous and involved children doing theater pieces, et cetera, et cetera, which actually we have a lot of um, documentation on and you can read about that um, in the book. So Bagatelle became a place to party. Um, we are now in the 1760s. Madame de Montconseil is getting old. She's having money problems. And the house she owns at Bagatelle is um, deteriorating very quickly. But then uh, what's also happening is uh, Louis XV dies and um, the reign goes directly onto his grandson Louis XVI. And Louis XVI has married Marie Antoinette. And there is an entirely new court life that starts at Versailles. And one of the key uh, personalities in this court life is the person we see in our next portrait, uh, very young, uh, fetching Comte d'Artois here on the left. Um, so the court at the time, um, and we're uh, in the early 1770s here, is Louis XV and Marie Antoinette. Um, the the Louis XVI, sorry, and Marie Antoinette, uh, the older brother of Louis XVI has died, so he, he becomes king, and he has two brothers, the Comte de Provence, who is a rather serious, um, very dedicated to studies and not very good-looking gentleman, and the Comte d'Artois, who is the young, elegant, entertaining uh, brother, who becomes one of the most popular personalities at court. And this is very important for us because he's the one who's going to be buying the Bagatelle estate and who's going to be building um, the chateau. But um, it's important to understand his personality and also his relationships at court to really get the sense of how Bagatelle came to be. The key there is the arrival of Marie Antoinette. So remember that Marie Antoinette um, was the daughter of the Empress of Austria. Uh, and when she arrived at court, she was struggling with two things. She was struggling with 
um, the rest of the court and in particular the relationship with some of the leading families there and also with her relationship with her husband which um, had a difficult start and they also had difficulty having children for many many years so the whole situation was quite uncomfortable for Marie Antoinette and in the Comte d'Artois she found a faithful entertaining friend and they organized a lot of parties together and um, uh, and we're spending a lot of time together indeed. And this gave the Comte d'Artois even more leeway to live his life of pleasure and parties. And one of the things that the Comte d'Artois loved to do was go hunt in the Bois de Boulogne. And because at the time you have to remember there was a very significant uh, Anglomania in France. The Comte d'Artois loved a very English fashion, which was horse racing. And so he was organizing a lot of horse racing in the Bois de Boulogne. In fact, we know from um, the ambassador of Austria in France, who was charged with, um, you know, uh, so overlooking the behavior of Marie Antoinette that uh, the Comte d'Artois, that Marie Antoinette attended a lot of the hunts and uh, horse races that the Comte d'Artois organized in the Bois de Boulogne. And uh, this was not viewed positively either uh, by the Empress of Austria nor by the rest of the court. So the two were seen as a little bit misbehaving teenagers, if you want. Nevertheless, uh, the Comte d'Artois organized these, these hunts, and after the hunts, he organizes dinners uh, in the Bois de Boulogne. And we know now that most likely these dinners were taking place at the house that was formerly belonging to Madame de Montconseil, that is, the house at Bagatelle. So as court mentioned, in 1775, the Comte d'Artois buys the estate of Bagatelle. Uh, but then you know what? Nothing happens. So one day in 1777, and this is the famous story of the bet with Marie Antoinette. Uh, Marie Antoinette and the Comte d'Artois are in the same carriage. They are on their way to the hunting season and pass by Bagatelle. And it so happens that Marie Antoinette tells the Comte d'Artois, oh, come on, you've owned this house for so long. It's completely falling apart. You haven't done anything with it. It's ridiculous. And he bets with her that before the end of the hunting season, which would be about three months, he would build a brand new chateau exactly on that location. And guess what? Um, that's what he does. And he does this in um, a very um, grand way. Uh, and that's partly thanks to some of the individuals that uh, are in his circle, which we can see two of them in, in the next slide there. Um, you see on the left here, uh, uh, Elisabeth Vigée-Lebrun, and on the right, the Comte de Vaudreuil. So the Comte de Vaudreuil um, is, plays a very important role in the birth of Bagatelle because he's uh, slightly older than the Comte d'Artois, but he's a little bit of his older brother in a way. Uh, he takes him around everywhere, participates in his parties. And the Comte de Vaudreuil is one of the key collectors, um, uh, uh, one of the key art collectors um, uh, at the time and knows uh, all the artists, uh, all the architects uh, that are active in France um, then. And um, sorry, the lady on the left here is not uh, Madame Vigée Lebrun, it's by Madame Vigée Lebrun and it's at the end, uh, La Duchesse de Polignac. And La Duchesse de Polignac is the mistress of uh, the Comte de Vaudreuil. And at the same time, as you probably know from your French history, the best friend and a very powerful lady, uh, the best friend of Marie Antoinette and a very powerful lady at court. So this little world, Polignac, Vaudreuil, Artois, Marie Antoinette are very close together. 
they spent uh, a lot of time together. And um, this is from these relationships and this familiarity with the art world that uh, uh, Bagatelle is going to be created. And we can see some beautiful drawings in the next slide. Um, on the left of uh, the Comte d'Artois, you can already see Bagatelle in the background. And on the right of uh, Marie Antoinette on horseback, supposedly Marie Antoinette on horseback, and maybe participating in some of the hunts uh, that the Comte d'Artois uh, organized um, in the Bois de Boulogne uh, at the time. And the outcome of this incredible bet, which the Comte d'Artois wins and Marie Antoinette loses, uh, is the creation of this Chateau de Bagatelle, which you can see there in the next picture. This is uh, an interesting picture because uh, it has been rediscovered in the last 10 years and we previously only knew it from engravings of the end of the 18th century. And this is exactly what the Chateau de Bagatelle looked like uh, when it was created and it was first uh, open to visitors from uh, the French court. And if you remember the first picture that you saw at the beginning, it is quite different uh, then, and we'll see you know, how, how all that uh, happened. What's very uh, peculiar about the architecture of the Chateau de Bagatelle is that it is not at all um, in the usual fashion of French architecture. In fact, um, it is really, and you can see the drawings of the architect uh, on the next uh, pictures there. Uh, so the architect is uh, François-Joseph Bélanger. He's someone that is an up-and-coming talent um, uh, in the artistic circles in Paris. He already uh, works for, quote, he's drawing um, mounts and works of art for uh, aristocrat collectors and and uh, and for Versailles, and um, he's appointed architect to the Comte d'Artois right before uh, the work start. So he draws this, and in fact, the reason why he creates Bagatelle like this, we believe, is because of the many many trips that uh, François Joseph Bélanger had made to England in the preceding years. So unlike many of his um, colleagues, Bélanger hadn't visited Rome. Uh, in, in fact, he, he's never been in Rome in his whole, whole life, but he had spent a lot of time uh, in England. And you can see how this influenced his work um, when we look at the next drawings there. Um, so Bagatelle is really a mixture of two traditions. You have here uh, on the left, of the screen, a drawing of the Pavillon Francais, which was built earlier uh, in the gardens of Versailles, which is a typical, you know, neoclassic uh, French building with this terrace here and no, um, no columns and these very large windows. But what you can see on the right there at the bottom is a much more neo-Palladian uh, building um, and what you can see on the top there is, in fact, the plan of a Neopolitan house that was drawn up by William Chambers. And the two drawings on the right here, in fact, are from the drawings of William Chambers. William Chambers was uh, a very, very successful British architect who had traveled to Italy. And one of the, uh, he became the architect of the uh, English uh, King George III, and he had spent a lot of time in Italy and was one of the proponents of the Neopalladian style. And um, we believe that the reason why Bagatelle looks uh, like the way it looks is actually because uh, he was greatly influenced by William Chambers, whom he visited several times in England. And this is why Bagatelle is, in fact, a Neopalladian building, not at all a traditional uh, French building. 
And you can see uh, on the next slide here in the view perspective, the bagatelle, that you have this Neopalladian building and then in front of it, a very large, um, also slightly Neopalladian uh, building where uh, all the staff and um, uh, horses and kitchens and everything and everything else was uh, was kept. And you can see here uh, in the next slide the uh, outline of Bagatelle of the inside of Bagatelle um, when it was built, and it's very striking that it's almost exactly the plan that was outlined by William Chambers, with only two rooms being inverted. So quite a striking uh, resemblance. It made me wonder whether maybe Bélanger had so little time to um, uh, prepare the plans from the Condé Artois that maybe he just took something he had gotten from uh, Chambers and just gave that to the Condé Artois and said to him, here, let's build that. Anyway, they build it, they build it fast. And some of the aspects uh, that we see of Bagatelle today um, on, the, on the next slide here, um, very much still look like what uh, Bagatelle was at the time. In particular, the entrance here uh, with the stairs uh, became very famous because it was one of the first stairs of its of its uh, of its kind. So, Baguette, the as as I said, the Comte d'Artois is very much in the um, very much has access to the art community at the time, and Bagatelle the. Uh, building and decoration of Bagatelle involves really the best, uh, the best of the best uh, draftsmen, artists, guild bronze maker, furniture makers, and painters um, of the period. And one of the uh, people involved in the decoration is the famous French painter Hubert Robert. You can see his works uh, in the next picture. And um, We'll talk about this a little bit later because um, they've, they've had an interesting history. These were painted by Hubert Robert in the bathroom of the Comte d'Artois. So that was the decoration of the bathroom. Uh, and give you a sense of the luxury. You can also see it in the next slide and the beauty uh, that uh, Bagatelle was. So what we see in these pictures is the main room of uh, Bagatelle. So Bagatelle was a very simple building. It had, you enter in the main entrance, on the left you have the dining room, on the right you have the um, uh, billiard room, and then at the end you have this beautiful music room where you entertain your friends, and then on each side are boudoirs uh, where you can retire when you need um, a little bit of privacy. Um, and uh, what's remarkable, is that the decoration of the music room, while it's been restored over the years, is still there and intact. And you can see it uh, here on these pictures. And it's one of the few decors, um, sorry, just go back. It's one of the few decors of the end of the 18th century with this very typical arabesque style that became fashionable at the end of the neoclassic period um, that still survives today. So Bagatelle was very famous for this incredibly beautiful and luxurious architecture. And it also became very famous right from the get-go because of all the artworks and guild bronze and furniture that was there. And this is what we see um, now. Um, some of the furniture uh, that was at Bagatelle has disappeared during the revolution upheaval. Uh, but some of it is still around. And um, you can see uh, on the left here, the furniture that was in the bedroom of the Comte d'Artois. And this is very peculiar features evoking his military role, which he never really had, but which he had. Um, and also this very um, end of the neoclassical period look. These chairs um, went uh, came on sale a few years ago, uh, but unfortunately sold for almost a million euros, uh, so we were not uh, able to acquire them. By contrast, the one on the right here, um, with this uh, green fabric, also came on sale and was sold for a much more reasonable price, 
And thanks to uh, a private donor, we were able to acquire it uh, at auction and we'll be able to put it back in the chateau uh, when it's ready. And you can see on the next slide, um, some of the decoration uh, that was at Bagatelle at the time, uh, an example of which still survives that you can see on the picture on the left. What's very striking is um, it's very typical of this uh, grotesque period of the 70s, 1770s and 1780s. And it's actually quite feminine and very colorful. What you see on the right of the picture is a drawing of um, somewhere close to what the bedroom of the Comte d'Artois looked like. And you can see that it's kind of, it's like a military tent in a way. And it had this extremely famous um, chimney uh, piece with uh, the sides in the shape of cannons, uh, which cannons were unfortunately stolen about 30 years ago. So don't exist anymore at Bagatelle, but uh, immediately became uh, extremely famous. And these cannons were, these guild bronze were made by uh, one of the most famous uh, guild bronziers of the time, uh, Pierre Gutier. And you probably know there was a, a very good exhibition of Gutier's works at the Frick Collection uh, a few years ago. So Bagatelle is famous for its uh, interiors. Um, and you can also see that, by the way, on the next slide, uh, which is a drawing of the ceiling of the dining room, which has now disappeared. Um, but it's also famous for its gardens. And, and we move on to the next uh, picture, which is a gouache of the Bagatelle Gardens after their creation. And this is another... Um, relationship, uh, another English aspect of the history of Bagatelle is that Bagatelle is one of the first places that um, gets an English garden in France. Uh, English gardens become very fashionable at the end of the 1760s and the 1770s. And Belanger, who has been in England for a long time, the architect, uh, is charged with creating an English garden and he hires um, someone that is going to spend their whole life in France, um, a, Scotchy, a Scottish sorry, um, gardener named Thomas Blakey, uh, who's going to be working um, for years trying to create the English, the perfect English garden um, for the Comte d'Artois. And uh, the English gardens of Bagatelle themselves become extremely famous and uh, it's considered a privilege to have the opportunity to uh, visit them. And uh, as you can see on the next slide, these gardens are gonna be typical, um, what in France would be called English gardens, um, which the English would call Chinese gardens, uh, very much on the model of uh, Kew Gardens in, in, uh, in the west of London, also the work of William Chambers, where um, really the whole idea is to create a picturesque setting, which means that as you move around the garden, everything you see is like a new beautiful picture. And these pictures consist of, you know, paths, artificial rivers, plants, and also these little follies uh, that are disseminated here and there, which evoke um, you know, China or philosophy or, um, you know, other um, fantasies. And one of the key features of Bagatelle, which you can see on the next slide, is its famous bridge. Uh, Belanger was obsessed with bridges. We know that from his um, correspondence with some of his other clients. And this is one of the, this is, I believe, the only drawing, uh, the only color drawing that exists of Belanger. And it shows one of the bridges that he built um, for the Chateau de Bagatelle. And you can see on the right of the picture there, the, what they call the philosopher's house, which was one of the follies uh, created for the garden. So, so here you have Bagatelle, uh, beautiful architecture, exquisite interior, 
um, incredibly beautiful garden. And uh, he, its owner, the Comte d'Artois, with a reputation of really being a party animal. Many, many mistresses, um, parties that acquire a very bad reputation at court. And there is an illustration of one of these parties. The Comte d'Artois doesn't show up there, but it's an example on the next slide of what um, you know these um, dinners uh, would be like. This is a drawing that's at Watson Manor today. Um, so really the easy life, uh, unfortunately, as you know, uh, this all comes to an end. Um, partly uh, the reputation, the terrible reputation of the Comte d'Artois as a party animal and a spendthrift, uh, in fact, contribute to uh, the demise of um, the French Ancien Regime and also to the very bad reputation that is given to Marie Antoinette. And we, the, the Met um, has recently received from the last right, right man a uh, gift. And you can see that on the next slide, uh, a beautiful drawing of Marie Antoinette, um, which shows her, um, you know, maybe in the gardens of Bagatelle, certainly saddened by uh, what is going on uh, at French court. Maybe it's already the revolution. Um, and, you know, the mood is further enhanced by this very pensive um, sculpture that is in the Bagatelle Gardens today. Uh, so Bagatelle, at the time of the French Revolution, is almost burned down. We know from the gardener that, um, you know, he's attending the, the destruction of the Bastille, and he says that when the French, the Parisian population is in the process of destroying the Bastille, someone shouts, let's go and burn Bagatelle, because obviously Bagatelle belonged to the Comte d'Artois. It so happens that maybe Bagatelle was too far away from the center of Paris. The crowd never made it there, and so Bagatelle was not burnt. Um, nevertheless, obviously, um, the revolution has happened. The regime has changed. So everything that belonged to um, the Bourbon family becomes uh, state property. Uh, and that's the case for Bagatelle and everything that was inside and everything that was inside is sold at auction, uh, like many of the, like most of the furniture and artworks that were in French palaces. So Bagatelle is empty and Bagatelle, in fact, during the French Revolution, um, we can move to the next slide, becomes um, a public place where Parisians can uh, uh, join uh, parties that are organized by entrepreneurs who um, so you can you can buy a ticket and go there and eat and dance and enjoy yourself. And obviously that's not very good for the interior of the chateau, which is um, significantly deteriorated at the time. You can see on the next slide a map of the jardin and the chateau as it stands uh, really at the beginning of the 19th century. Uh, but then, you know, new people will um, become owners of Bagatelle. And so the domain uh, starts an entirely new life. And it's very much, um, there are very much two sides to this new history of Bagatelle. One is that of a hunting lodge and the other is um, as a residence for the children of France. So the first new owner of Bagatelle, we see him in the next slide, is Napoleon I. He loves the place. Uh, we can move on to his portrait on the next um, on the next slide, please. Here he is uh, in all his grandeur. Uh, Napoleon loves Bagatelle and. Um, uh, very often hunts there, although uh, he's actually not a very good hunter. He 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 likes to go there, and uh, some of you might know this. Napoleon had this grand um, project to create a whole new imperial city, uh, an imperial palace, but as big as a city um, uh, on the west of Paris. And Bagatelle was going to become part of this of this of this plan. Uh, the plan was abandoned after the disaster of the Russian campaign. Um, 
uh, and Bagatelle, in fact, just remained the hunting lodge for Bagatelle, for Napoleon. You can see on the next slide uh, a picture of Napoleon hunting in the Bois de Boulogne. Um, in fact, there is a very peculiar story about Napoleon hunting in the Bois de Boulogne, which is uh, which you can see. No, which you don't see actually. Um, so we'll pass on that. Uh, as I said. Bagatelle is a hunting lodge, but also a place where uh, children um, get to grow up. And the Roi de Rome, who we see on the on the next slide, uh, is very much uh, one of these. Um, in fact, you know that Napoleon left Josephine because he couldn't have a child with her. And uh, when he had the Roi de Rome with Marie-Louise, Josephine was very keen to meet um, the Roi de Rome to get to you know, at least see him. Uh, and Marie-Louise was totally against that. Uh, but we know from private records that, in fact, Napoleon agreed to arrange uh, a very private meeting between the very young Padron, who was a baby, and Josephine. And that actually, that very touching uh, encounter, in fact, took place in the music room of Bagatelle. And you'll see in the book, there is a very moving uh, text describing uh, that encounter. Now, um, as you know, French history moves very fast at the beginning of the 19th century. Uh, so Napoleon has to go. And, um, and quite uh, like the rest of the royal, the formerly royal domains, Bagatelle comes back to his former owner, the Comte d'Artois, the Comte d'Artois has um, changed. He's not the frivolous young man anymore. Um, so he decides to give Bagatelle to his son, the Duc de Berry. And you can see on the next slide, uh, Bagatelle at the time with um, um, the uh, private guards of the Duc de Berry. And on the uh, next slide then, the Duc de Berry on the right and the Duchesse de Berry on the left, and behind the Duchesse de Berry, uh, the domain of Bagatelle. So the Duc de Berry, um, like Napoleon, is going to use uh, Bagatelle um, as his uh, main uh, hunting lodge and organizes a lot of hunts and a lot of parties uh, at Bagatelle. And in fact, he does so right from the get go, from 1814. Um, when when he owns uh, Bagatelle, but as you know, the 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 new reign doesn't start very well because there is this hundred days episode where Napoleon attempts to come back, uh, which is an incredibly humiliating moment uh, for the Bourbon uh, family. Um, and we know uh, a few years later, and that's illustrated on the next slide of this anecdote of the Duc de Berry hunting and bringing down this big eagle, uh, which uh, that's illustrated in this picture. And this big eagle is obviously a symbol of Napoleon and his empire. And this symbol of the Duc de Berry killing the eagle is so important that the Duc de Berry decides to um, uh, have uh, the eagle embalmed and this picture painted, and both the eagle and the picture were actually uh, in one of the main rooms at Bagatelle, demonstrating his final or the Bourbon's final victory against, um, you know, Napoleon. Now, the Duc de Berry is actually assassinated by a partisan of uh, of the Bonaparte, and um, the Duchesse de Berry and her children, which we see on the next slide become uh, the owners and inhabitants of Bagatelle on the next on the next slide there. Yeah, here you go. And you see these very cute little children. And the Duchesse de Berry, who's very much uh, into the new fashion for neo-Renaissance and neo-Gothic. And um, really, uh, Bagatelle becomes very much a children retreat, uh, which is beautifully depicted on the next slide there. Um, the Duc de Berry is not there because he's, 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 he's been assassinated already, but you see uh, the young um, Comte de Chambord, the son of 
the Duchesse de Berry and his uh, older sister and the staff uh, and uh, the Duchesse de Berry uh, enjoying themselves in the back garden, um, in the back garden of Bagatelle. So this goes on um, until uh, 1830. And this is a time where the Duchesse de Berry is very much hoping that uh, her son will one day become King of France. And you can see on the next slide, one of these propaganda pictures that are created then uh, showing the young Comte de Chambord um, uh, entertaining soldiers and very much um, you know, communicating the message that this is the next leader of France. Unfortunately, that's not going to happen. The French are doing another revolution. Um, the first French king after 1814 was Louis XV, the, 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 the former Comte de Provence, and then the Comte d'Artois, who become Charles X, as Quart has said. And unfortunately, Charles X makes significant mistakes in his management um, uh, of the government, the people he appoints and what he tries to do. And that results in the three uh, days of revolution in uh, July of 1830, and he has to emigrate to England again. And uh, so do the Duchesse de Berry and her children. So that's really the end of um, the imperial and royal history of Bagatelle. And um, it's really the beginning of new times. It's uh, the Duc d'Orléans becomes King of France. There is a, a Chambre des députés, a parliament, and parliament decides to reduce the size of um, the state holdings and decides to sell Bagatelle. And it takes them five years. Um, so that transports us to the next slide where you see Paris um, at the end of the 1820s uh, in a time of uh, very much uh, prosperity and economic expansion. And there is one individual that will play uh, a key role uh, for Bagatelle that lives in Paris at the time. Uh, unfortunately, Bagatelle deteriorates pretty quickly. You can see a picture of Bagatelle at the time on the next slide. Um, and it looks to be in a fairly sorry state. It's a very gloomy picture. So who's going to want to buy that? The person who does, we can see on the next slide, and that's uh, Lord Hartford. Uh, Lord Hartford is a descendant of one of the most powerful English families of um, the Regency period for very complex reasons that you can read about in the book. He becomes, um, he grows up uh, with his mother in France while his father actually lives in the UK. And um, his family is one of the wealthiest uh, in England. Um, and when his father dies in particular, the young Lord Hartford becomes one of the wealthiest people in Europe. And he's not a very social person. He's not a socialite at all, but he has an incredible passion for art. And he becomes uh, one of the most powerful and most active art collectors of the time, of the 1840s, 50s, and 60s. And one of the things he likes to collect is French 18th century art, which is being rediscovered at the time, so we're talking about Vato and Boucher and also the beautiful furniture of the Ancien Regime and some of the uh, items that um, most likely decorated Bagatelle as well. And he collects all these very avidly. And it makes sense, therefore, that when he sees Bagatelle in this story state, he decides to buy it and restore it. And you can see on the next slide, uh, one of the paintings that he acquires, uh, which um, uh, which actually hangs at Bagatelle and is typical of you know what they call at the time the French school of the 18th century, uh, which you can see is very much um, in the spirit of the interior of Bagatelle, 
as we can still um, see today. Um, some of you might know the um, next painting by Fragonard. And there is, a, there is a very specific story to that painting, uh, which is acquired by Hartford in 1865 at an auction, which will, uh, which will help us understand what happened to all the artworks that Lord Hartford collected and that were at Bagatelle. We're very fortunate to have uh, pictures taken uh, by a famous photographer named Marville at Bagatelle at the time of Lord Hartford. And we can see one of these pictures um, in the next slide there. You can see that Bagatelle still has its very Neopolitan look. So that hasn't changed yet. And uh, you can see how the garden was organized at the time. And you can see the interior on the subsequent slide as it is today on the left and as it was at the time of Lord Hartford with typical Second Empire interiors mixing 19th century furniture with what Lord Hartford collected, so bull furniture. Some of it is fake, some of it is right. And uh, these typical 18th century uh, armchairs. You can see that also on the next slide, um, beautiful gilt bronze, some of it 18th century, some of it 19th century in the in the music room um, and also pictures of the music room on the left. And uh, some of the decoration of the time which still exists today uh, on the left slide. And we can show you there as well the back of, if you move on one slide and then another. Um, yeah, and then on the next slide, um, the back of, uh, of uh, Bagatelle. There is a very peculiar story um, that I can show you there, which is illustrated in the next picture, which is that um, um, uh, Lord Hartfield owned this painting and he was convinced that this was the portrait of the Comte d'Artois. Um, and he had this in one of his boudoirs and he called it the Artois, the Comte d'Artois boudoir. Whereas we know, and in fact, this painting is in a private American collection. We know that this actually represents the Duc d'Orléans. So it shows you that collectors don't always know exactly uh, what they have. What's happening to Bagatelle, and we can see it on the next slide, uh, very much relates to the destiny of Lord Hartford. So Lord Hartford has no wife, uh, no children, um, but he has an illegitimate son who becomes his private secretary and then his advisor. And when Lord Hartford dies in 1870, um, this illegitimate son and art advisor uh, inherits from everything that Hartford owned, including Bagatelle. And um, Richard Wallace, that's his name, actually transformed Bagatelle quite significantly, uh, changes the facade of the chateau and uh, destroys the um, building that was in front of it and builds uh, this Trianon, uh, very much in the fashion of the Trianon in Versailles. And this is why uh, the facade of Bagatelle today uh, looks quite different uh, from uh, what it looked like uh, earlier. And you can see in the next slide that um, uh, Wallace also builds these new uh, stables uh, very much in the syncretic style of the end of the uh, 19th century. And, um, and you can see in the next picture on the left, Lord Hartford, and on the right, Richard Wallace, who's going to uh, transform Bagatelle. Um, and uh, it's very peculiar that you, you can see this portrait of Napoleon that I showed you earlier on the next slide because it actually belonged to the collection of Hartford and Wallace, um, who were quite fascinated with, uh, with him. And in fact, not only they were fascinated, um, Hartford uh, was also very close friends with um, Napoleon III and the Empress Eugenie, who you can see on the next uh, slide. And um, there were uh, some of the only visitors 
uh, that were allowed by him to come to Bagatelle. Otherwise, very few people were actually um, invited. So there is this very strange painting, um, which we found in a private gallery that uh, purposely showed shows Bagatelle uh, in the seventeen eight in the sorry eighteen eighties. Next slide, please. Uh, but in fact, um, Bagatelle never had water in front of it, and probably never hosted any of these parties. So maybe this shows us that a lot of Parisians had the fantasy of attending a party at Bagatelle, um, but they never did. And the reason they never did is that. Uh, Richard Wallace, uh, in this beautiful picture that we see there on the next slide, um, was a very private man. Um, and there uh, you understand the destiny of what um, was in the Wallace collection. Um, a lot of the paintings and objects um, ended up in the residence of Wallace in London. Remember the he inherited everything, so he was extremely wealthy. And this is what has become today the Wallace collection. And the next picture shows this uh, famous Fragonard painting that you all know. Um, in uh, restoration proce process, it was restored by the Wallace collection last year. Uh, and you can now see it in its full glory. Um, in London. And you can see here, and we'll talk about this later, a very beautiful sculpture of Houdon in the next slide, please, um, which is extremely moving. And on the next slide, you can see, if you have very good eyes, this sculpture on the right here on the terrace of Bagatelle. Um, and then the question is, where is that sculpture today? And maybe some of you will know. Anyway, that brings us to the next slide and uh, Bagatelle at the beginning of the 20th century. And I think I'm running out of time here. Um, and as Kurt said, Bagatelle is, uh, you know, Wallace has died. Um, his wife has died as well. So Bagatelle is sold to the city of Paris. And we're very fortunate that the head chief of the gardens of the city of Paris um, actually falls in love with Bagatelle and uh, dedicates a lot of effort to preserving it. And one of the ways he does that is together with colleagues, they create a beautiful rose garden, a picture here probably in the 1910s or 1920s. And they create what is gonna become a very famous uh, rose competition that still exists today. So a lot of people still come to Bagatelle. Um, uh, at the end of June to see the rose competition and admire the, the rose garden. So Bagatelle continues to live um, in the 20th century. We can move on, to, we can see a map um, of Bagatelle on the next slide in the early 20th century and some pictures of the garden today um, in the next slide. Um, and some pictures of the people who loved Bagatelle in the 20th century on the next slide. And this is on the left, the Comtesse de Grefful, a very powerful socialite um, who organizes one of the grandest Bagatelle parties in 1909 ever organized. Um, and she asked Marcel Proust here on the right to um, write an article, a, a newspaper article about it. And because Marcel Proust spends most of his time in his bed, he actually doesn't get to write the article. Uh, so he writes an apology um, to La Comtesse de Grefful that he didn't write that article. And while writing his apology, tells us how he much how much he loves the gardens of Bagatelle. And so you can read that quote um, in the book. Anyway, um, Bagatelle is going to be the place where Parisians entertain themselves. And you can see some of that in the next slide. Um, and that really goes on throughout the 20th century. You have some beautiful um, uh, fashion shows, car shows at Bagatelle in the coming slides. Yeah, the beautiful car. And here on the left, a famous model named Capucine. Um, 
at Bagatelle, and on the right, the Marquis de Cuervas organizing some dance parties uh, at Bagatelle in the 60s and 70s. Um, so this is the Bagatelle that we have today. I'll just finish by showing you um, how it came to be like this, because uh, when we got it, and that's the next slide, um, the facade of the building actually looked like this. And so there was quite a lot of work involved uh, to restore it to what it looks like today. So there was fundraising involved. Next slide. A lot of work involved. Next slide. And then finally we got from this, next slide, to that. Next slide. Um, so the Chateau de Bagatelle returned to its former to its former glory. However, we've only done the work outside, and we still need to do the work inside. And you can see in the next two slides that some aspects of the building uh, still need uh, quite a lot of intervention, especially the first floor there. I'll just share you a little anecdote with you. When you restore buildings like this, you have a lot of bad surprises. And then sometimes, as you can see on the next slide, you have good surprises. Once when we were uh, doing works under the chateau in the underground, we found a door that had been condemned and we opened it and uh, behind the door, we discovered this, which is a bronze sculpture. And you can see in this postcard on the right, which is from the beginning of the 20th century, that this sculpture actually used to be on top of one of the sphinxes uh, in front of the chateau. So that was quite an exciting discovery. So that's Bagatelle today. And um, you can see on the next slide. And we can talk about um, what's going to happen in the next few years. As you can see on the last slide, the next one, we certainly intend to con continue to have nice parties Thank you, Nicholas, so much. Before we get to your questions, everybody, we have a few upcoming programs that I would like to mention. On October 20th, we'll be doing an online webinar entitled Ablaze, the History of the British Country House on Fire, um, which will be presented by my friend Christopher Ridgway, the curator at Castle Howard, and hosted by me. And then on November 3rd, we're actually having uh, one of our rare in-person events in New York City, um, a presentation I'll be giving with lunch called American Versailles, Philadelphia's Linwood Hall. Now, let's get to your questions. Go ahead and type your query into the question panel, and we will answer as many of them as we can in the time provided. I'm going to start off first by asking, is it possible to visit the house today or just the gardens, Nicholas? So... Um, yes, as I said, the restoration uh, is in progress. So while it's possible to visit the gardens, it's not yet possible to visit the house. The outside of the house of the chateau has been restored, but not the inside yet. We are still fundraising to do that. And we're also fundraising to restore the Trianon, the other building. Um, uh, so we're hoping that a year, a year and a half from now, it will be possible to visit Bagatelle again. Thank you. Um, was the inclusion of peacocks, which apparently we see now, part of the historic design and part of the past of Bagatelle? So we believe peacocks appeared in the 20th century when the garden was managed by um, the city of Paris. We haven't seen any traces of peacocks at Bagatelle at the time of Hartford and Wallace, but I'm not entirely sure about this. Well, peacocks always ask, ask add a nice aristocratic air. Um, so of the collection, whether it's furniture or paintings that was once in Bagatelle, do we know where some of these great pieces are today? Have they been dispersed to the winds? And can we see them, for instance, in museums? Yes. So as I said, um, Hartford and Wallace uh, put together a really incredible collection. Some of it was in England. 
that became the Wallace collection. And some of it was in France in an apartment in Paris and at Bagatelle. And unfortunately, everything that was in France through complex um, inheritance processes uh, was eventually sold off to a dealer uh, that sold it off to collectors. Now, it turns out that a lot of the great collectors of the beginning of the 20th century were uh, wealthy Americans who gave their collections to uh, American museums. So you can actually see uh, quite a few uh, of the things that were at Bagatelle in American Museum today. And we've seen two of them in the presentation. One was this beautiful Houdon sculpture, uh, which I believe in the US is called uh, Winter. Um, and that's in the sculpture hall of the Met. When you get into the sculpture hall, it's, on the, it's immediately on your left. And it's one of the masterpieces of Houdon. And if you remember, we also saw this set of paintings by Hubert Robert. And these paintings, there are actually uh, six of them, are also at the Met uh, in the Reitzman rooms. If you know the Met well, there is this room that has, um, I believe, eight Hubert Robert paintings and the lacquer furniture of Marie Antoinette. Of these eight Robert Robert paintings, six of them are the ones that were in the bathroom of the Condartois at Bagatelle. Very so, cool. I don't have bathrooms like this. <laughs> well, speaking of Marie Antoinette, um, someone wants to know if it's possible that she had an affair with the Count d'Artois. So, um, very good question. The specialist of that topic is named Evelyn Levert. Uh, she's published all the correspondence of Marie Antoinette, and there is a lot of it. And she's also done a, a very careful study of the correspondence between Marie Antoinette and um, Fersen, who uh, was very close to her, uh, the Comte de Fersen, um, right at the time of the revolution, in fact, helped her escape. The, her conclusion is that the only person that Marie Antoinette had a relationship with was actually Fersen and nobody else. You have to remember that um, if you were at court uh, at the end of the 18th century, in fact, throughout the whole 18th century, it's perfectly normal and acceptable for everyone, including the king, to have mistresses and in fact, for all the ladies at court to have lovers. The one person that can't have a lover is the queen because everyone wants to be absolutely sure that her children are from the king. And I think the, the common belief today from all the academics that have looked at it is that Marie Antoinette only had one lover right at the end who was Fersen. Very, very good to know. Um, Margaret wants to know if there is a French equivalent of the English National Trust that preserves historic houses throughout France. So there isn't. Uh, there are, well, in fact, a little bit like in the UK, there are a number of organizations, uh, not-for-profit organizations, including our own, the Fondation Mansart, that deal with um, you know, certain buildings, but there isn't a large... Uh, organization that also involves a lot of volunteers um, and that's very unfortunate but it's related to the fact that the the state plays such an important role in the preservation of buildings in France. Um, Jane asks about um, the price that the house would have been sold for let's say in the um, early 19th century when it was bought, bought by um, Lord Hartford. Do we have any idea of how much in inflation adjusted values, was he paying a fair market price? It was considered not worth that much when he purchased it. <laughs> we know that he, we know from a friend of his in his memoir, he says that the uh, Hartford buys it for 300,000 francs. Uh, but to be honest with you, I haven't done the work to figure out how um, expensive that really was. To give you uh, a marker, uh, Hartford is very famous for a bidding contest with um, Lord Rothschild to acquire the Laughing Cavalier. Oh, of, yes. Um, uh, which is actually now one of the masterpieces of the Wells Collection. And he pays 54,000 francs for it. 
So Bagatelle would have uh, cost six times that. But at the time, 55,000 francs is considered an insane fortune for a building. So all this oh, is... Oh, that's very interesting. <laughs> because I, I would have suspected, considering the rundown condition it was in at the time that Lord Hartford bought it, that it may not have been considered that, that desirable. So that's very interesting. No, I, I, I don't think it was considered that desirable. You know, 18, in the 1830s, the neo the neoclassical period of the 18th century is completely out of fashion. Oh right, I didn't know that. It comes, um, it comes back in fashion later in the 1860s and 70s. Um, so Deborah wants to know if um, so Richard Wallace and Lord Hartford are buried in France or in England. Huh. So Sir Richard Wallace is buried at um, uh, the Père Lachaise in Paris. Uh, in fact, we found a lot of documentation of his burial ceremony and all of that. Wallace, I haven't had the chance to uh, talk about that, but was a very um, active philanthropist, both in England and in France. And he was extremely famous in France at the time. So, in fact, a lot of people attended his uh, burial in 1890. I believe Hartford is buried in the UK. I'm not 100% sure about that. And Sir Richard, if I'm not mistaken, had a French wife, did he not? Richard Wallace? Yes. Yes. He had a French wife. Um, he was famous for not wanting to speak, to speak in English um, <laughs> in England. I, I remember seeing a photograph of her years ago. And she seemed very matronly, um, uh, sort of um, not what you'd expect, not glamorous. Let's let's put it that way. Very unglamorous. No. Yes. Wallace actually had uh, several mistresses, including uh, Madame Sabatier, who was one of the most powerful uh, ladies in the art world in Paris. So really. He created a great network from that, uh, but he still had his wife. That's very interesting. He seemed like someone who was almost a recluse. He didn't get out that much. I I'm surprised to hear that he had mistresses, but good for him. Um, so we have um, Suzanne who wants to know if you can repeat the the name slowly of Marie Antoinette's one confirmed or probably confirmed lover. Uh, the Comte de Fersen, F-E-R-S-E-N. He was Thank Danish, you. actually. I, it's funny because I was thinking he was Swedish, but I'm glad you said that because uh, I knew she... Um, no, I, I don't know. I just remembered that she I had. This is the one who helped arrange um, the, the botched attempt to escape, is it not? That's right. Um, that, that, that they didn't, the royal party was so slow in their horses that they eventually gave up and they never made it out of France. Um, just another bit of stupidity on the part of Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette um, in a long line of stupid things. Um, so is the sculpture you showed us in the Bagatelle Garden um, Antinous? Sorry? The sculpture that you showed in the Bagatelle Garden um, of a man uh, could that could um, that be Antinous? I don't think so. No, um, I would have to look back, but I don't. I don't think that's Antinous. No. Um, one of the things that I'm just going to pop in here that I noticed was that um, something that's interesting for me as someone who studies um, British historic houses is that what is considered to be the first Asian-inspired garden to appear in England happened at Cliveden. Um, which was a house that was restored to how it's currently seen today by William Waldorf Astor. And he bought um, a number of pieces from the Bagatelle Gardens and installed them at Cliveden. Um, Asian-inspired designs. I mean, when I say Asian-inspired, it's important to remember, of course, that no Chinese person would ever recognize this as being really Chinese, but the European idea uh, of chinoiserie. Um, and it, it, he was very proud, um, William Waldorf Astor was, to have purchased this in the Bagatelle. And I think it just shows you um, how much prestige was attached to um, Bagatelle. And for people like like Astor, who were very well informed and sort of a member of the Cognoscenti, that, that he knew that this was something important to be bringing um, from, from France to England. Yes. And in fact, there is a picture in the book of... Um one of the uh, one of the uh, Ch Chinese houses that was in the Garden of Bagatelle. And I believe the picture is when it was at Cliveden, and then it was moved to Esther's house in the south of Italy. 
Yes. Uh, and I think it's actually still there. And the one we have in the garden of Bagatelle is actually a copy. <laughs> I love it when things like that happen. Um, you mentioned that the stairs at Bagatelle were the first of their kind. Can you tell us um, why that is? What made them the first of, and what kind is that? And so, yes, we have descriptions of the time that people admire the fact that there is no, there is nothing under, uh, these are technical terms, I don't know, but there is nothing under the stairs. So they kind of, um, they're like suspended in the air. Right. Also, the the balustrade is admired for its uh, very fine design. Um, so that's one of the things that people admire uh, at the time at Begatelle. And I think the last question I'll pop at you is, do you think that the, the boudoir at Addingham Park in Shropshire was inspired by the boudoir at Bagatelle? Which boudoir, that, sorry? So th this is a house in um, Shropshire, England, owned by the National Trust, and it's spelled A-T-T-I-N-G. H A M. It's pronounced oh, Addingham. Yeah, 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 sure. And they have it. They have this this um, very much looking French inspired neoclassical boudoir, which this um, viewer wants to know if you think that one inspired the other. I have actually not seen the Addingham boudoir, but I can tell you a little bit about. Uh, we haven't talked about this actually. Um, so the Comte d'Artois is famous for having created this boudoir between the ground and the first floor of the Chateau de Bagatelle that was entirely covered with glass, Ooh. with mirrors. Oh, I read about that. This is for sex, right? So you can see yourself having sex. Well, and I should say, so. I should say, I'm, I'm going to give a plug to the, everybody. So this is the book, which is a, a big, lovely book. And I've been reading this, which is how I discovered that um, the, the Count Artois loved to show off his sexual prowess. Um, and thus the mirrored room. But the illustrations in here, just like what you saw um, with the um, PowerPoint presentation, are just fantastic. And um, there's so much French history packed into this. I think it should be a part of everyone's library. And I'm sorry for interrupting there, but please go ahead. No, no, that's um, so that 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 uh, boudoir became a very famous feature of Bagatelle, and hmm. people would visit it up until. Um, uh, you know, up until uh, Napoleon became an owner. And we know that this boudoir continued to exist uh, until um, the end of the life of Lord Hartford. And when uh, the chateau was restored, it disappeared. And um, the ceiling, which was very low, is now a lot higher because the boudoir has disappeared. And Wallace put a, a Boucher painting on the ceiling instead of it and that painting is actually now in the collection of the gulbekian in spain oh wow that's very cool um <laughs> a lot of stuff happened there it, it's amazing how a relatively small house has had such a large influence and how its bits and pieces have sort of wandered around the world um, unfortunately that is all the time we have for today if you have any questions for nicholas you can email us at heritage tours at nehgs.org and we will answer as many of those questions as we possibly can for you if you're interested in purchasing nicholas's book the follow-up email that we'll be sending out will actually have on it um, a link to amazon where you can purchase the book and as always thank you so much for being with us today. As you leave the event, you'll have the opportunity to fill out a survey and give us your feedback. As we continue to expand our webinars and online offerings, any and all feedback is extremely helpful and appreciated. This free webinar was made possible by the generous support of members and friends around the world. Please consider making a gift to American Ancestors to keep these programs free and to create more programs for you and others to enjoy. Stay safe, stay healthy, I hope to see you again on our future online programs. Goodbye for now. Bye-bye.